I want to talk about uh, the big picture, uh, which Ned always bids us to do, and that means uh, the world, and uh, why I believe that we're at a time of a fundamental change of uh, politics. And by politics, I mean all dimensions of collective action. In economics, of course, politics is uh, essentially about meeting public goods. Public goods uh, change over time because of uh, changes uh, in the human condition, in technology, uh, in scale, in the nature of the challenges. Today's challenges are global and regional, and by regional I mean international at a scale typically of a continent. Uh, we grew up in the era of the nation state. The nation is no longer a good definition of where the main public goods lie for most uh, purposes, and so we're moving, I think, away from a nation state system to a more complex system of governance. But it's not easy because every institution, uh, such as the UN uh, at the global level or uh, the EU at the regional level or ASEAN, is basically still driven by the nation state. That's where the power, the taxation, and the armies are. And so the nation states won't give up their prerogatives easily though they are the wrong level of aggregation to solve the problems that we have. So a great deal of our global problems are that we're trying to solve global and regional problems or local problems with nation states. Uh, that is a legacy of the Western European system. It's uh, anachronistic. Uh, we're not over it yet, but things are changing very quickly. So what are some key characteristics of the current era? First. The most important fundamental characteristic is an economic convergence between the North Atlantic region, which led the world economy for the last 250 years, and the rest of the world. Not all of the rest of the world, to be sure, but uh, even the lagging parts of the world, most notably Africa, I believe, will have a very rapid catching up in the next decades. So I think convergence is the dominant feature of the world economic scene. This is uh, creating multipolar geopolitics. They'll be nice when you go to Washington, just whisper that, don't say it loudly. Uh, Washington still believes that it's a unipolar world. It is delusional, it's creating wars and conflict, but we are in a multipolar world, whether Washington likes it or not. Of course, we're in an era of hyper-rapid technological change the fastest in history because uh, we now have uh, machines that make the change for us as well and we have an acceleration of technological change. All technological pessimism I think is a mistake. Uh, we have uh, no shortage of technological breakthroughs. Of course how we use the technologies is quite another matter. Is it AI for drones or is it AI to solve uh, problems, and we're not quite clear on that. We have, of course, a profound environmental crises that are deep, real, intensifying, and at an urgent stage. We're in, already in the acute phase of human-induced climate change, destruction of biodiversity, massive pollution, which claims many millions of lives per year and already uh, in the acute phase these are of all public human induced climate change destruction of biodiversity massive pollution which we hear wisdom someplace uh. <laughs> thank you um, these all require public goods of a new kind at a global regional biome ecosystem scale and of course we're grappling with uh, creating that, and we're not succeeding uh, now 51 years after the first conference on environment and economy in Stockholm. We have rapid demographic change, not all bad. The world population is going to stabilize and start to decline in the 21st century. That's a good thing. We're completing the demographic transition, an aging economy, an urban world economy, a significant rise of Africa's share in the world economy to perhaps one-fourth or even a third of the world population by later in this century. 
And we now, as I'm emphasizing, have public goods at regional, by that I mean transnational and global scale, to an extent that is unprecedented. And that requires a different kind of governance. So we have outgrown the nation state. We need political subsidiarity. Subsidiarity is the concept that we don't have competing polities at different levels. We have a kind of uh, concentric a circle of politics where global problems get solved globally, regional problems get addressed regionally, national problems get addressed nationally, local problems get addressed locally, with the basic dictum, go as local as possible consistent with the problem. And I think that this is the right idea about public goods. Uh, U.S. hegemony is a chimera, uh, very dangerous right now because uh, everybody knows it except the United States. Uh, and so the U.S. is actually provoking a lot of war and tension and conflict right now as it uh, struggles to come to grips with its limited power. And fourth, we're going to need an ethical basis for the global and regional public goods because all of economic life depends on an ethical formation, uh, shared precepts, implicit or explicit, and this now has to happen at a global level, and I'll give a few thoughts to that very quickly. I wrote a bit about this in uh, a book in 2020 called The Ages of Globalization, and my main theme was that to understand global scale change, we need to understand the interplay of physical geography, technological change, and institutional change. And all three are paramount in our own age. And of course, as a, as a materialist as I am, uh, I believe that uh, human history has essentially been paced by technological breakthroughs uh, and essentially in energy, food, transport, and data. Data defined broadly to include computation, transmission, storage of information. And the major eras of human change are eras of breakthrough. Fire was the first era that enabled us to have larger brains, so the encephalization came with the harnessing of fire, the harnessing of agriculture, the domestication of the horse, uh, the uh, uh, discovery of uh, how to uh, mobilize wind and water power already uh, two and a half to three millennia ago. Uh, of course, the breakthrough with fossil fuel, with the steam engine in the 18th century, uh, with the electric dynamo in the 19th century, nuclear age, and so forth. So all of this is to say we are very much paced by large technological changes. The dominant technological changes of our day came out of the uh, wonderful imagination of Alan Turing and John von Neumann. Uh, and uh, the uh, architects of the digital world with the transistors and integrated circuits. And this is a deep transformation that is uh, propelling us today. So in good uh, classical uh, enlightenment uh, form, I uh, approach this as a stadial theory of change, meaning you make stages. Uh, I uh, designate seven stages, I won't go through them in this brief period, but each is paced by major technological change which gives rise to political change. It creates city-states or nations or empires or transoceanic empires and we are in another phase of fundamental political change. So just a word about the geography of long-term development an unbelievable amount of uh, economic development takes place between these uh, narrow latitudes uh, because they are favored uh, in, uh, with the lucky fortune of a band of uh, east-west geography of temperate and semi-arid zone steplins and uh, temperate agriculture which encompassed typically 70 or 80 percent of the world population and almost all of the technological changes in history and the major empires line up incredibly along uh, this line throughout history. So in most of human history, 
Asia was, from as far back as we know it, the most populated part of the world, 65 to 70 percent of world population. China and India have been giants in population for two millennia, at least. And for most of that time, per capita income didn't vary so much as, as we know, and I'm using Angus Madison's famous uh, estimates here. Uh, it meant that the shares of output more or less tracked the shares of population with the modest variation for different periods like the Song Dynasty being a particularly uh, prosperous period in China, for example. Uh, but aside from the ups and downs, uh, Asia was the center of gravity of the world system. Then, of course, this began to change very gradually after the beginning of the 16th century in the so-called age of discovery or age of conquest, and it really took off after uh, the end of the 18th century because of the steam engine fundamentally, uh, the era of industrialization. And since that came to England first, uh, England uh, used that uh, uh, um, uh, to uh, conquer much of the world. Just to say, as everybody knows, it is the great accident of history that Europe became the first to industrialize uh, and to conquer uh, Asia because it was absolutely far more likely, I'd say something like 10 to 1 in favor of China in the 15th century, that it would go the other way. China was very close to discovering the sea routes to Europe and even possibly to the Americas uh, across uh, the uh, Northern Pacific. But in 1434, the single worst economic policy mistake in human history was made when uh, the mandarins at the Ming court scrapped the Chinese fleet uh, and just ended what was the mega age of uh, discovery and uh, oceanic transport of the giant fleets of Admiral Zheng He. Absolutely no deep reason for it. It was a catastrophic mistake. The next time the sea routes uh, were opened uh, between Europe and Asia was Europeans going to conquer Asia, not Asians uh, going to explore and trade with uh, Europe. So Columbus and Vasco da Gama. And my favorite uh, lines from The Wealth of Nations, which is uh, a remarkably uh, wonderful and humane book as well as a, a brilliant uh, treatise. But my favorite part is uh, this. Uh, Adam Smith says, the discovery of America and that of a passage to the Indies, East Indies by the Cape of Good Hope, that's uh, 1498 uh, and 1492, are the two greatest and most important events recorded in the history of mankind. Big statement. Not bad. Uh, connecting the whole world by these two oceanic uh, voyages. Their consequences have already been very great, but in the short period of between two and three centuries, because Smith is writing in 1776, which has elapsed since these discoveries were made, it is impossible that the whole extent of their consequences can have been seen. And then what's wonderful about Smith in the Scottish Enlightenment is he points out that while this was generally a beneficial fact to unite the world, it was disastrous for the native inhabitants of the East and West Indies, he says because he says that they were relatively weak at the time. He didn't understand that they also brought pathogens of the old world to the Americas that wiped out the population. So Smith could not have understood that, but he did understand conquest. And he said something incredibly humane at the end, which I think marks him as one of the great thinkers of modern times. He said, hereafter, perhaps, the natives of those countries may grow stronger, or those of Europe may grow weaker, and the inhabitants of all the different quarters of the world may arrive at that equality of courage and force, which by inspiring mutual fear can alone overawe the injustice of independent nations into some sort of respect for the rights of one another. But nothing seems more likely to establish this equality of force than that mutual communication of knowledge and of all sorts of improvements, which in extensive commerce from all countries to all countries naturally or rather necessarily carries along with it. So what Smith is saying is in the future, there's going to come an equality because trade is going to carry knowledge, technological improvement, and an equality of force. 
basically, we are 250 years after Smith's writing, and that prediction has come true now. So Smith was in the middle of a 500-year period. 500 years ago, Asia in the lead and the center of gravity and in the technological lead. Europe becomes the agent of change. The steam engine, a reflection of that, not something that came out of the blue, but came out of Francis Bacon and Isaac Newton uh, and Empire. But it came out of a Glasgow workshop, uh, the condenser on James Watt steam engine. And there came a new European and North Atlantic-led world. But as Adam Smith said, eventually trade will rebalance. And that's the convergence that we're seeing now. So Watt's steam engine, historians are right to say that what was so fundamental about the steam engine is that it broke the organic barrier of the traditional economy. Because basically, all, almost all energy of the primary energy of the pre-James Watt economy was organic. What you could feed to human beings for their labor and what you could feed to the animals for animal traction, plus a little bit of wind and a little bit of water. But basically an organic economy and we moved to a fossil fuel economy and that let loose the ability to do work of an unimaginable scale. So everything changed with the fossil fuel breakthrough in the last two and a half centuries. And of course, Europe got there first and Britain got there first of the first. And in the geopolitics, we ended up uh, with the British world. This is a map of a wonderful book, The Countries Never Invaded by Britain. Those are the ones in white. Uh, <laughs> Britain went out and just beat the shit out of everybody. And really nasty, by the way. Nasty. In 1839, showed up uh, in uh, China and saying, you have to import our opium. No, we don't want your opium. You don't want our opium, we'll beat the hell out of you. That was the first opium war. It was followed by the second opium war. No scruples at all, sorry to say. So that's power. That's the power of one-sided industrialization and it conquered much of the world. Long story, and I won't go into it, but the baton was passed to uh, the younger uh, Anglo-American kid brother uh, in 1945, uh, the great Anglo-Saxon handoff, and the US became the next empire. And the idea was that we would dot the world with 800 military bases around the world, and uh, Henry Luce made the sweetest love song to American leaders telling them this is the American century. That is always captivating. It was captivating to Chinggis Khan. It was captivating to Lord Palmerston. Uh, and it has been captivating to American leaders uh, since then also to believe this is your century in the world. It's over, but we still have 800 military bases around the world. Uh, I believe the Ukraine war is likely to be America's Teutoburg Forest uh, defeat. Teutoburg Forest was the uh, lost by uh, Augustus uh, Octavian in AD 9 when the Roman Empire tried to cross the Rhine to the east to take over Germania and was defeated. It didn't end the Roman Empire. It just told them this is a limit and you're not going beyond that limit. And the United States is going to learn a limit that NATO doesn't just expand at U.S. will. There are limits to that and that's the painful process that we're in right now, um, but it's a secret. Don't tell anyone outside. Uh, you're likely to be canceled uh, if, if you do. Um, so the world changed fundamentally after the Second World War. The United States aspired to be the world leader, but something else happened to bring Adam Smith's forecast to reality, and that was the end of the imperial age. If there is one dimension of imperialism that I think needs to be understood, it is that imperial powers do not educate the natives. And if there's one dimension of economic development that needs to be understood, it is that education is the absolute central feature 
of development. Because without education, nothing else can happen. And so the European imperial powers left the world illiterate, left their colonies basically illiterate. At the end of the colonial rule, the first thing that happened was mass education. We're still not there yet, but this is the most fundamental breakthrough that happened after World War II, the end of the colonial imperial era. And the United States does its empire in a different way through regime change operations, so it's not exactly the same uh, as the occupation imperialism. But what countries got with their sovereignty was the ability to educate their people. And this has led to economic convergence. Just to show you the gaps, the peak of North Atlantic power was 1950 compared to the rest of the world. 56% of the literate world in 1950, roughly by my calculation, was in the North Atlantic region, meaning Western Europe, the United States, and Canada. Now it's 13% of the literate world. 60% of world output was in the North Atlantic region. Now it's 33% at purchasing power prices. 53% of all urban residents were in the North Atlantic world in 1950. Now it's 14%. The world's converged. Urban, literate, technologies have spread. Adam Smith was right that trade was actually the fundamental carrier of this. It was when China opened up that the acceleration of technological change came so fast to China. It was Japan that invented this process of rapid infusion of technology in the Meiji Restoration in 1868, and then again after World War II in its rebuilding. So we now see that Asia and the North Atlantic regions have crossed paths, again, using Madison's data updated by IMF data. Uh, the North Atlantic was the dominant power until uh, this gap started to close in 1950. And by around 2010, Asia is now larger than the North Atlantic region. This is the real change of the world. We know that the BRICS, even before the recent expansion to six more countries, were already larger than the G7. That's a transformed world. And China, of course, overtook the US in GDP measured at purchasing power parity around 2014. But China is still much poorer per capita, maybe a third, but with more than four times the population. So this is the reason that China is a larger economy. So I want to argue very briefly that we're in a new age a new age, which I call the age of sustainable development. We're there in part because the scale of economic activity and a population 10 times the size of when Thomas Robert Malthus wrote The Principles of Population in 1798, which was then about 900 million people and today 8 billion people, now has put so much pressure on the physical environment that we are in urgent need of global public response to climate, biodiversity destruction, loss of ecosystem functions, and so forth. And the world adopted goals addressed to this. It's fitfully trying to achieve them. Today at the UN, this very day, is the midpoint review of the sustainable development goals. They're way off track, nice objectives not being achieved mainly because the United States and other rich countries don't care at all about it. Uh, and so the world governance is not organized to achieve these goals at this point. But these goals are the real global goals and needs. So we have a very perilous moment because we have arrived at multipolarity. And as Adam Smith talked about, that balance of awe and equality of force to create justice, that's a delicate, difficult transformation. And just to say, there are several different theories of what's going on right now. Robert Kagan, uh, whom you may know is our chief uh, neocon ideologue and the uh, husband of our uh, acting uh, Deputy Secretary of State, Victoria Newland, 
uh, believes uh, that American hegemony uh, must rule and will continue to rule. Otherwise, the jungle will grow back, as he says. Uh, wow. Uh, Henry Kissinger says uh, that we need a balance of power theory. Balance of power is okay, except it becomes imbalanced, uh, and it's extremely difficult to manage. And when Bismarck was uh, thrown out by uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II, it was the end of Europe's balance of power, and World War I came in response when Bismarck's genius at balancing was lost. Uh, John Mearsheimer says we are inevitably in tragedy. That's just the nature of great power politics. Mearsheimer is extremely uh, intelligent, predictive, an extremely nice person, but, it, but tragic to read because he says that conflict is inevitable. I don't buy it. Uh, now, another theory of, uh, that I read uh, 50 years ago of a uh, wonderful uh, professor of mine also, Charles Kindleberger, uh, said we need a hegemon. So if it's not the US or Britain, it's got to be someone else like China. I don't buy that either, uh, but this is a brilliant book. Boy, it led to a lot of late night discussions uh, over the next 50 years. Um, Graham Allison says, uh, as with Sparta and Athens, uh, we're prone for war, not inevitable, but uh, the war trigger is very high because of the rise of China. And my little contribution is, could we get our heads together and address global public goods and avoid global public bad? So I argue that we need a rational approach, not a tragic approach, and that it is not beyond us to reach the cooperative corner of the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, in other words, we can understand the game, we can understand the risks of defection, but we can understand the benefits of cooperation. And so we should be able to reach that cooperative outcome. So I would argue that we need a new geopolitics and a new ethics of sustainable development. I often refer to President Kennedy's inaugural address when he said, the world is very different now, for man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. So what hangs in the balance is something extraordinary. We could achieve SDG 1, end poverty, or we could blow up the world. And what is absolutely incredible is how this is in the hands of a very few people. That's what's incredible. And by the way, my takeaway from Oppenheimer was what a bunch of geniuses that invented the bomb and what a bunch of dolts who use it or decide about using it. This is our paradox. It took the greatest geniuses of the age to understand nuclear fission and how this uh, could be created. And then it fell into the hands of uh, the everyday uh, person who might not have the imagination to keep us away from global disaster. That's technology, by the way. Technology is often created by geniuses and used by all of us. Uh, and uh, that is the real issue that uh, Plato was wondering about already in the Republic uh, 2,350 years ago. How do you make the rulers uh, know what to do? He said you have to raise them from birth for that purpose. So there are crucial public goods at regional and global scale. This is something new. Regional scale, like the European Union or ASEAN or African Union, this is something new how important this scale is. And global scale is almost unprecedented in human history. We had global trade, we had interconnectedness, but global public goods, not so much. Now we are with the center of global public goods, but institutions in the hands of nation states. Why? Weird. So I believe we need new kinds of global governance and ethics, and uh, I think the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a good place to start. We're in the uh, 75th anniversary this year. 
And I believe that we can even find a common wisdom, which I call the ABCs uh, of ancient wisdom, Aristotle, Buddha, and Confucius. They all, by the way, were virtue ethicists. They basically said, cultivate your soul as decent people. It said it in somewhat different ways, but they said it's virtue that gives us the capacity to reach the cooperative solution, whether it's civic virtue, friendship virtue, or the other virtues of sociality. And Aristotle said it's possible because we are zoon politikon, we are political animals, we can be sociable. And so I think finding this commonality of East and West is crucial now because there actually is a strong commonality of the underlying cultures. This was already pointed out in the uh, observations of uh, the axial age uh, uh, that these philosophies uh, arose roughly the same time and with uh, roughly the same uh, philosophical underpinnings. And I'll just end with uh, President Kennedy's remarks 60 years ago. We're at the 60th anniversary of Kennedy's remarkable initiative to make peace at the height of the Cold War and to no negotiate the partial nuclear test ban treaty, which was ratified just these days, 60 years ago. Kennedy may well have been killed for it because rogue elements of the US government hated him for his peace initiatives. And uh, I believe that this is probably what uh, did him in. Uh, but he made uh, wonderful observations about peace. And uh, I'll just end with his uh, most beautiful words. So let us not be blind to our differences, but let us also direct attention to our common interests and to the means by which those differences can be resolved. And if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future. And we are all mortal. Thank you very much.